um, share my screen in just a sec. Hi, everybody. My name is Parisa Schulte. I am an education technology consultant for TI. I cover um, Arizona, New Mexico, and part of Texas. I'm a former middle school math teacher and a former T-cubed instructor. I'm very excited for y'all to wrap up your day with us with this wonderful session with Michelle Bonds and Brian. They are joining from two very separate places in the world. And we owe Brian a big round of applause because it's very early in the morning for him. He had a fun, exciting night and he's here to do some coding with us. Um, and of course we owe Michelle as well, but we're happy y'all are here on the Saturday. At the end of this session, we're gonna send you a survey and we'll pick one winner for some technology. In my last session, I used a very random generator um, I asked my five-year-old to pick a number between one and 76, which was the number of participants we had, and that's how we got our number. So um, we will do the same this time, and I will announce the winner at the end. So I'm going to go ahead and just pass it off, Brian. You can just start your screen at that first slide, and um, we'll go from there. Beautiful. Uh, so I'm hoping you see my PowerPoint there. 35 years of impact T cubed. Yes, sir, uh, we got it. And uh, here we here we are uh, launching on our way. Now you see there the photo of the two of us. I I've actually um, uh, been at Michelle's sessions quite a few times, and and she's helped me in mine as well um, at the uh, various T three I C conferences. Um, but here we are, first time actually co presenting, which is great, even though it be in a virtual manner. Um, so I made up these introductory slides and I didn't have a photo of Michelle, but I do follow her, her YouTube channel where she does some wonderfully motivational things for her students, including this playing dress ups, I think. Uh, so she makes these great videos and uh, just reading through your blurb there, Michelle, um, engineering background, is that, is that giving your students a, a, an unfair advantage for the engineering club in the STEM competition? Um, but well done there. Uh, STEM, of course, also a passion of mine. Um, and here's a little bit of my background and a, a photo from a few years back now. Um, but I, I um, have been fortunate enough to be on the T-Cubed Australia journey right from the very beginning. And um, so that's that's been a, a wonderful, wonderful um, thing through my career and also, of course, for my students. Um, but let's take a look at our agenda for today. And uh, yes, we're looking at coding, but if you look further into it, the um, this notion of productive struggle being the uh, you know, coding, the key that opens into productive struggle, it can be one of many keys. I quite like this productive struggle idea. Uh, earlier this year at the uh, International Conference in Fort Worth, I ran a session on problem solving, and that is one of the things that is often written in relation to productive struggle. Let's take a look at that. Now, we, when we say struggle, we don't mean um, just sort of uh, stumbling around in the dark, which is what I'm doing at the moment, by the way, because it is something like six o'clock in the morning. Uh, but uh, don't worry about that. Um, but what I quite like here is that, that there is a need for effort on behalf of the learner. So it's kind of like no pain, no gain. Um, and we need to bring in some creativity and particularly the problem solving, uh, which as I said, is an area that I quite uh, that I am quite interested in and have run many sessions on that. Um, so it's, it's, it's in the challenge um, programming, coding is what we're going to look at in this session. As I said, that's one of many keys that could be used. Indeed, productive struggle isn't necessarily um, directly related to programming. It isn't, necess it isn't exclusively even the domain of mathematics. But of course, coding and mathematics can be great pathways to uh, guide our students towards this type of, type of thinking. And I like to also think algorithmic thinking, logical thinking, computational thinking, all of these things uh, are, are intertwined and the key to it, as I said, is the, the task that we start with, a rich task. You could set me um, pages and pages of calculus exercise problems and I could work through and I could give you solutions and I could 
learn absolutely nothing. But give me one good task, one good problem that I can really grapple with, that I can explore, that I can look at it from different angles, and it gets me thinking. Um, and that can be, uh, you know, in that struggle, much more learning. As I said in my session earlier this year, um, I presented some activities on problem solving. What are some of these good, rich tasks? This is one of my slides from that presentation. And I talked about my own classroom story where we specifically run a unit on problem solving. It's not something that just naturally seeps in. We, we explicitly teach it. The unit that I've used for that year after year is something that I uh, took as a gift from uh, Tom Rock, from Tom Reardon, who was also a presenter earlier in today's conference. And Tom, if you want to see uh, the materials that he shared for us all, uh, it's on this link here. Now, Parisa has a copy of this PowerPoint, so you'll be getting a copy of that along with our TNS files. Uh, and you could follow that link to see Tom's uh, problem solving unit that I have used. And that is based on the uh, four steps of problem solving uh, as defined by George Pollier. Now this next one, this is an Australian resource, Maths 300. Um, so you might like to explore that. Uh, another great, um, great bank of good, rich tasks. Um, and closely related to that is a thing called the Mathematics Task Center. That's where I'm going to take you uh, today. You can see below there are some links to TI codes and TI activities. Michelle is going to expand, expand on that in the second part of our session. Um, but let's uh, first of all look at this Mathematics Task Center. You can see the, the graphic they've got on the first one. I'm just going to click on this because I've hyperlinked it to the actual website. And uh, the activity there, a lot of the tasks here will be ones that you've seen before. So they're the old favorites, the classics. And look what's happening here, number tiles. I expect you've seen, if not this activity, but some many that are similar. Take um, nine digits, arrange them such that one three digit number added to another three digit number will sum to a third three digit number. Okay. Um, now you've noticed that these are on uh, maneuver, ma <laughs> maneuverable tiles, so it invites you to have a go, to, to, to grab the tiles, shuffle them around, try it out. And you know what? Very first time you try this, I bet you you do not get the correct solution or a correct solution. Um, so you have a go again. You don't mind. This is productive. This is a productive struggle until you find a solution. It might take you half an hour before you find a solution, but you know what? How many, how many math exercises have you done in that time? Yet if I were to give you a worksheet with a hundred or so, you know, addition exercises, boring, but here, you, here you're engaged. Let's jump down and have a look at some more of these tasks and I'll hand one over for you to do. Um, there is a library of them. And I think we've got about 240 tasks in all. Um, the way this works if you buy the product is it's a kit with uh, the, the problems written on the cards. And each one has these little manipulatives to invite students to have a go. Um, if you look at the titles of these, many of these I expect you may have seen before. Not quite nice, colorful, inviting. Um, yet can get into some pretty high-powered maths fairly quickly. And the one I'm going to start you on is this one here, Crazy Animals. And if I click on that, it takes us to that task. And you see here some of the math that's involved. Um, we're getting into Venn diagrams, tree diagrams, um, it, binomial expansion, and the binomial theorem itself pops in fairly quickly. Yet the task is simple. I have used this in lower elementary right through to 12th grade. Um, the kids in elementary, or oh, the way it works, 
we have a picture book, okay, where we can change the head and the body and the feet of various animals, okay? So, for example, I now have the, uh, the head of a duck, the body of a giraffe, and the legs of a horse. And if you look at the wording there, that's a daze. Um, so I'm going to invite you to have a bit of a go at that. First of all, let's just jump back to our PowerPoint. Uh, I reckon we could make an improvement. Why use giraffe and horse and duck when we could have Australian animals like a wombat, a koala, and a dingo? So we've got three animals in a picture book. We're going to be able to interchange the head, the body, the legs. My question to you, how many different animals can we make by doing this? Parisa, we might like to type answers into the chat. I love Go Australian ahead and put your answer in the chat, everybody. How many different animals do you think you can make with that picture book? Three animals each cut into three parts. I'm seeing a few few suggestions coming in here. Saw some nines, now seeing a lot of 27s. I'm wondering how that has come about. Um, did you possibly think three by three by three? And if you did, well done. I reckon that is the correct answer to that. Um, you could call it three to the power three, and you could wonder how this may be modified. Let's have a look at that too. Oh, here's the next challenge. What are, what are all their names? Now you heard what I said before about computational thinking. Even in lower elementary, if I ask students to create a list of the names of the animals, for example, we take a W for the if we're, you know, if we're using the head of a wombat, if we're using the body of a dingo, we would have IN. And if we used the legs of a koala, we would have LA. So that would give us a winla. Okay. How many different animals could be made? 27. What are the list of names? Um, and students will naturally go about this in a computational way of thinking. But I wrote some code because... That's fun too. Uh, would we like to open the file? Yes, we would. So let's switch across to that. Uh, I'm already starting to get too many things open here. Let's have a look. So this is the uh, in TI Basic, a bit of code that I wrote for this. Um, don't worry about the code yet um, because Michelle's going to, to take you through some guided uh, tasks that will help you learn how what I've done here. But just a quick overview, um, this is in TI Basic, and I've set up some, some uh, strings here, shall we say, um, or vectors if you prefer, and I've called the first one head, the next one body, the next one legs. They're kind of variables at the moment, but they're empty. Uh, this display is just when the program runs, it's going to output some text, uh, and it's going to say something like this program will generate the combination names for three animals okay and then we wait a second and then i'm requesting strings where the user types in the information okay uh, it's first of all the head of the first animal the body of the first animal the legs of the first animal and so on um, and now i've used a trick here that's called a loop i've actually got three loops here that will work out and display the list of animals. Michelle will take us through more about that later on. Uh, let's just run this and see if it works. It's always better if it if it does. Now, I've jumped across into a different application here, uh, still within the same problem. I'm now on a calculator application. And what's happened when you store a program, it's actually stored as a, as a variable. So as I hit the vars list, 
you see all these variables that were set up they're within the program um, but the program itself is called animals that was the first thing I did when I defined the program if I click on that here we have it um, the, the parentheses there just mean yep we're ready to go uh, some programs are set up such that they expect you to type something in the parentheses but this one not uh, let's run it okay so we had that welcome message and our first animal uh, I'm gonna have to go down to on my slice to see just just how I broke those words up uh, W for wombat uh, O M for the body and B A T legs uh, koala and dingo and there we go and there's our list of animals all 27 of them and you can scroll through and read these interesting names a wabat a wago a wingbat coombat coomla coomgo yeah interesting dombat Hmm. Oh, a dingbat. Oh, and a dingo. So that's the sort of fun we could do. Um, just a twist on this. What if I showed you the chick, the picture book? What if we had an additional page, like one more animal? So instead of just the the wombat, the koala, the dingo, we threw in an additional animal. How might we adjust the code to cater for that? Well. First of all, I suggest we change our little welcome message to say it's going to be for four animals. And you can see here where we're reading in the strings. Well, animal one, two, three will possibly need, in fact, not possibly, we will need this last bit repeated for a fourth animal. So I'm just doing a control C, control V here, which is, I just love doing it on the computer. It's, that's another thing. When you're coding, it is so much easier to write your code on the computer application and then transfer across onto the handhelds is what I recommend. Okay, so you can see there, the adjustments I'm making here. This is now going to be for animal number four. And we will need to change this. What this is referring to here is which element in the, uh, which element number in the vectors of head, body, and legs. And with the looping here, I'm going to make it count through i, j, k, not up to three, but now up to four okay now to save the code you can see an asterisk here which is reminding me okay your code as you've typed it now has not yet been saved so if I go into the menu and go to the second one here check syntax and store uh, that's the way I like to do it there are a couple of other ways but I like to do to I like to drive things through menus that's just the way I think which is a nice feature of the of the software I think of the Inspire software it does cater for the different thinking styles um, okay you can see I've jumped to my calculator application here mm, excuse me um, so let's run this var animals and okay it's now saying we will have four animals each cut into three sections. Oh, first of all, the challenge is how many animals do you think we'll get? Uh, it's not going to be 12. It's going to be more than 27 for a start, is it not? Is it going to be four to the power four? Or will it be three to the power four? Or will it be four to the power three? Ah, we have to think about this, don't we? 
Um, let's just have a quick look and then we'll hand over to Michelle. Um, so we've still got our arm backs and our uh, koala and a dingo. And what do we run with now? Oh, I know. I thought you'd like that. <laughs> and there they are. And of course, we finish with a Michelle. That ran fast too, ran, ran by too fast for you to count them, I know. But we'll just quickly review back there. And as somebody correctly said, it's now uh, going to be, uh, where are we? Four to the power three, because we've now got, if you think of the box filling way of, of approaching our combinations, we've got four ways of filling the first box multiplied by four ways of filling the, the body box multiplied by four ways of uh, filling the legs box so four to the power three and of course you could extend this for saying well what if we cut the animals themselves up into more slices and so on and how would the, how would you adjust the code um but you, i can see you're itching to get into the coding itself let's jump into that my starting point and and this is a great one to uh, to assign to students um because it's just get into it and off they go um, now, I'll just uh, just a word of warning here with the title, 10 Minutes of Code, it's on the TI website. Now, the, the title 10 minutes, this does not mean that you will master it within 10 minutes. What it means is that within 10 minutes, you are hooked, okay? So this comes with a, a, a warning, do not start this late at night, because that's you, you're up all night doing this stuff, you're going to be hooked. Um, so. Following the link there, uh, well, first of all, you, you, you saw that it was for um, the different platforms. So it can be for 84, if that's what you're using, or for Inspire. And you can take it further to use the coding to program the TI Innovator Hub, and then from that, subsequently, the Rover, uh, and my latest acquisition, also a drone, um, which is a bit of fun. Um, launching into it. You've got the uh, uh, the kickoff here. There is also a teachers' lounge. This is this is a series of online lessons. Um, but if you're sort of you know getting a little older like myself, mm, um, and prefer to have a hard copy of things, if you click on the teachers' lounge, you can actually download the entire uh, booklet, shall we say, or PDF format of all the lessons. There are uh, uh, there is a course, six units each with uh, three skill builders, and there's projects at the end to test your skills on that. And uh, as I said, you can, if you prefer, you can download the whole lot. And there's also links to more detailed books to work with. And uh, here we have the first six, or the, or the list of the six units, which is an appropriate point for me to hand over to you, Michelle, who will launch you into this. Your okay. hand at the ready. Yes, I am. I am ready. I am ready to go. Thank you, Brian. So we are going to start exactly where Brian left off. So his program that he was showing you, of course, he created. So you may be asking yourself, well, how can I create this? The book, there's tons of activities out there. You may even be having some ideas. Oh, this would be an awesome if it was in a programming type content. But of course, TI does not create content for every single book out there. So why don't we let the student learn the basics of coding? Think about the productive struggle. If you gave them an activity they may have seen several years ago, even in elementary and said, can you write a program to model this? And the teacher doesn't actually have to teach the student how to do the coding. The productive struggle also can be in the learning of the coding. So you're going to, you can have math 
that is buried in there, you also have tons of what um, we call best practices. Those things can all be buried into coding, which is why I love the fact that our world today is taking codes and putting it inside of all kinds of content in schools. Um, me as a former engineer turned teacher um, was, I just got giddy at the fact when coding came out. And of course, if you did not know, TI has had the capability of coding on their calculators for several years before it was a thing, but now it's kind of come to the center and we have this wonderful website that our kids can use um, on a daily basis. You can do it once a week. Um, you could even do it once a month. Of course, it may take a little longer for the students to get to a level of coding that uh, is required. But you can use these in your classroom and you're supposed to let the student work their way through it. It is really not meant for the teacher to get up there and click through each step and lead the student. No, this is a student problem based with the learning to code itself. Look at the skill builder. First of all, it has objectives. So if anybody has lesson plans and your principal is one of those that you have to have an objective to every single worksheet you throw out there. Well, we actually do. The objectives are there. No problem. They're listed for you. So you can put those in a lesson plan. It also kind of helps you if you're trying to remember which skill builder is teaching what. So this is how simple this is. It literally says, start a new document and add, select, add program editor, has that little carrot sideways. So you could actually call that the greater than symbol and new. So when your students are looking at this, the first thing they can do is they can read, hey, that's a lesson in itself. Um, the hardest thing I had to teach my students, no matter what age group I was teaching, was how to read the instructions. So the first thing they need to do is actually read the instructions and then follow what it's telling you. So over on my calculator over here, I have my home screen. And of course, if your calculator or your students open the calculator, the first thing you see, you have the little house, you can click on it to get to here. We notice that you have a list of menu. And so for those of you that are not real, real familiar with the Inspire, then I will break this down just a little bit. So your scratch pad is how you can do quick stuff. When you actually want to get into coding, and creating really good mathematical things, you're gonna wanna use the actual documents. So if we just do the uh, new document, notice that the picture on your calculator is starting to match the sample picture that is given in the actual skill builder. It tells us to go down to add a program editor. So there's my add a program editor and then go over and go to new. Now we have done step one. All we've got to do is click on step two. Notice the pictures match. Now, as you can see, this is not meant for a teacher to stand up there and read this for the students. This is a productive struggle in itself. And it is amazing <laughs> how you can get and train your students to figure things out by reading instructions. And I think this is such a good skill. When I first started teaching, I never dreamed of this. You teach a little bit and then you realize these kids, it's like they open a page, I don't know what to do. And I'm like, did you read the instructions at all? And they look at you like, what do you mean? And so what you really want to train your students to do is to be able to think for themselves. And if it gets a little challenging, let's take our prior knowledge, plus our instructions, plus why don't we try something? The worst thing that can happen is you have to start all over. And of course, with these skill builder 
the way the website is set up, it is real easy to go back to the first page. So if they lost their way, it is real easy to start over, find your way again. It's not going to hurt anything if they have to do it again. So this is our basic, we're going to say hello for our basic program. And so we're just going to type in. And then we're going to leave the pro the type as a program. And we're going to leave the library access as none. And then we are going to click OK. And we have started our program. So notice that Brian's program, it was already created for you and there were lots of lines of code. This is what it looks like in the beginning. It tells you the name of your program. It, that's the define. It will automatically generate that. You have the word or the actual little shortened version of program and then in program. So what you need to remember is everything you're going to type is going to be in between those two little words. Notice the skill builder literally explains what it should look like. It gives you a note about the uh, OS versions. And these are actually updated. So these skill builders, Texas Instruments don't just create them. And 10 years from now, they look exactly the same. These are updated as needed for new operating systems and things like that. Now on the page, you not only will see the words, but you will also actually see these windows that are mapped out. I have several students that will try to go through and do these skill builders just based on looking at the pictures. And I will tell you most of the time, I'd say 99% of the time, the students cannot do this by just looking at the pictures. They're going to have to read at least some of the instructions. And that is one thing that I like about it. So if you have a student that says, I don't know what I did, the first thing you can do is have them start all over to actually read and they will and make them read it to you. If you do have some learners that have a little bit of trouble with reading, then you can definitely read it to them, but make them ask you, make them say, okay, I'm lost. What do we do? Make them start to read. And of course, you, you should know your students well enough to know. Well, I know this student doesn't read very well, so maybe I need to read a big section for them. But uh, most of these don't have big paragraphs. They're basic words. So even your if you have ESL learners or even if you have learners that um, are not necessarily on that level, then you can fill in and read for them. I'm not saying you don't have to do that if you so choose. I'm just saying that we need to give the students that struggling time to figure this out. And then next, it basically says that, hey, we have all these programming commands in the menus. And it says that we can actually go to these menus in order to find them out. With your text cursor inside of the dotted box in the editor. Notice how easy this is telling you. It's literally step by step. I know I, I have an engineering degree. I'm also certified in computer science, but it doesn't take my level of knowledge in order to create these codes, folks. It's literally simple enough for your students to do. And I will say I have had sixth graders write simple programs with my TI Inspires. So I, I promise I have witnessed it myself being done. So when you are in the right box with your cursor blinking like it should be blinking between the program and in program you're going to select menu which is right here and i i will go slowly through this because i do want um everyone to understand where the keys are on the inspire so forgive me for going slow at first i promise i will speed up a little later but here's the menu when it pops up as you can see you have number six is going to be your input output and then you have display just like it told us on here to do just like the pictures are showing next step we are going to type 
the quotation and it talks about gives us some of the vocabulary that we might not would learn in a mathematics or science classroom literal string template which means a string is when we are actually using words that we want to display on the screen it also sat there and says that it has the it's showing the double quotes and it tells you how to get those double quotes. So I know some teacher used to we used to do um, a calculator, a scavenger hunt so the students can learn the calculator at the beginning of the year. Coding is not. I mean, coding is a good way to actually have the students learn the calculator also, and it gives them these hints of where to find some of the things that they will use later on with your other math or science things in the class. So it says we're going to press the control key, which is right here. And then we're going to do the multiplication key, which is right here, which gives us our quotes. Now the inspire is wonderful. We got the open quotes, closed, closed quotes. And inside those quotes, we're going to type the text. Hello world. Now, yes, the kids can type this a whole lot faster than I can type this. <laughs> but um, when you do this, down here at the bottom, um, it is ABC order, not a QWERTY keyboard. Um, for testing purposes, ha not having a QWERTY keyboard is a must on a lot of the tests so that we can uh, use these handhelds. But you can, if you want to do it the correct way and use your capitalization, there is a shift key that you can use and we can type the words, hello world. And then it tells you to use the shift key for capital letters. It also tells you to press that little question mark, exclamation mark key that is on your calculator if you want to get that exclamation point. So it's even telling the kids different buttons on the calculator. So there's so many uses that you can use. There is a space key down here. And I will quickly go ahead and type this out. I hope some of you guys are like following along on your own. Because the only way for you to really get used to doing the coding is to actually do it yourself. Trust me, typing on these calculators um, was not, I did not learn how to type like really, really quick um, by only doing it every now and then. It does tell you at the bottom, there's a note that you must type the quotes before typing the text. Next, and notice Brian actually ran his code a different way. On the Inspire, there are always more than one way to do things. So this is another way to actually check your program and to be able to run it. So this type of coding, TI Basic, actually needs to be what we call compiled. So it's going to check the syntax and store. So we're going to do that by going to Menu. Notice it says check syntax and store and we're going to click that. Notice that your asterisk is now gone and it tells you it has been stored successfully. So now to run the program, we are going to do a control R. Notice we get the same place where Brian was when he used his var key. So this is another way to run the program and then we just hit enter and we get hello world and you have now completed your first program. So they're also on the skill builder. It tells you how to view or edit your program step by step. And it tells you to, you can save the document. Now remember on an Inspire right now we have a program, but this program is inside of the document. This is not saved yet on the calculator. So you're not going to be able to go back to the memory to see it until we actually save the document itself. So rem you have to remember to have your students do that if they want to be able to use the programs for later on. That's definitely something that has to be done at that key point. So when you go through these skill builders, it takes the students now each the 10 where the 10 minutes comes in is like skill builder one should only take 10 minutes for the students to do it may be a little longer at the beginning to the kids get used to it but my kids got it really really quickly so by like the third week of school 
um, they were doing these skill builders fairly quickly. And I use these as bell ringers. That's what I started to do once it came out with TI codes. I started using these as bell ringers. And so the students were there um, with the navigator system. It was real easy to grab what the students did, whether they were finished or not. I could see, you know, what they were working on. If I wanted to give a grade, I could. If I wanted, as you get on down there, you're going to have um, different types of programs. Some will have data. We could use that. Um, if we were going to be doing a certain topic that day that uh, I wanted that skill builder to actually line up with, that I wanted some information to use for class, I could build all that in and grab it real easy with each student's calculator. So as you go through the skill builder, it's actually going to teach different things. This is where we're going to write a program and a function. I'm just going to go ahead and go into this. It talks about function. As you notice by Skill Builder 3, we're actually building in some math. In this case, um, we are looking at how to find the hypotenuse. Um, another thing that I like about coding is um, we give our kids so many different formulas for the kids and we tell them to memorize them and then we just hey we're going to do this rote over and over and over but what helps with this productive struggle is if you tell the kids hey we're not going to make you memorize the Pythagorean theorem just write a program for it the productive struggle into getting the students to just be able to solve for c literally without numbers is huge. Literal equations was always where my students had lots and lots of trouble. Um, even the ones that, hey, we're going, you know, you put numbers in, they could solve equations with the best of them. However, what happens if I just want you to solve for the letter and all you have is letters? So it's all variables, but I want you to get and isolate one variable, which is a huge skill for upper level math. And I taught a lot of honors classes over the years. And using programming was a way to motivate them to start learning above and beyond just plugging and chugging the numbers. And in this TI codes, the very first unit takes them to that. And it's walking them through it in a way where they're not going to be totally lost. And of course, they can go back and look at any step that they need. At the end of each unit, you're going to find an application. Once again, productive struggle. OK, so we've learned some things. What do we actually do with this? So this particular application is going to write a program to evaluate any formula that you want to do. So it has the students, it kind of walks them through to get them started. And then what it's going to do, it's going to say, here's your task. You're going to write a program. So you pick which formula and notice you see a lot of formulas in here that your students could use. And yes, there are times where we want the students to be able to maybe plug and chug, which is, you know, that that's not a problem. But the students are going to be able to understand these a whole lot more if they're actually writing an algorithm in order to solve problems with this. So just, you know, memorizing the formula is not what we are trying to teach them. We want them to understand the formula so we can use coding to create now a more productive struggle while we're learning about the formula and how to use it, which is one reason why I love, love these TI codes. Now, back to the animal problem that Mr. Brian introduced to you. You will notice that it had some re request, which we've already seen the display. We've sampled that. As you go through the unit, you're going to see those different types of coding lines will be taught to the students. And we're going to skip on down to unit three. And you should notice the first thing in the object objectives use request and request string this was one of the first things you saw in the code this is where it's explained unit three so you don't have to go far to get a program i bet a lot of you when you saw that if you're not a programming genius when you saw brian's code you're like i am never going to be able to write a code like that 
right here. All you have to do is go through this. Your student, and that's the thing is if you get the students to write it, it's a whole lot better than having the um, teacher to write it. But I want you to realize here it is unit three request. There you go. There's the line right there. This little skill builder is going to walk you through how to use the request. Here's the if statement. Remember that you had the if then statement. Okay, here you go. This is where that's located. And then if you look at unit four, this is where you're going to find some loops. And when you go through the skill builder, it talks about the repetition. It shows you all of your control. The while loop, we didn't really use that in ours, but that is actually handy for later. It lets the students learn by practicing some loops. And here is an example of the code itself of what a loop should look like. And this should look really familiar from our animal program that we showed you earlier. Let's look at the application. To show you another application, so this would be like unit four. Now I will just quickly, if you go to unit five, you have list, graphs, dynamic program. Unit six is drawing, and they all actually also have end of course projects. So you could literally, make the TI codes last all year long, really. And you can also get some ideas for some other projects for your students by looking at the application. Notice that all of them does have the download. So if your students doesn't ha don't have computers so that you can click through step by step, you can actually download the document that takes the students through these steps also. So just so you know, and I, I I think about most of our schools have uh, computers or Chromebooks available for students. But if you don't, there is paper copies that you can provide for these students. So in this application, this actually is what a non computer programmer would look at as a complex program. And in four units, your students will be able to create codes like this. Think about the world that opens up for productive struggle. If your students can create their own code to solve the problem. And that in itself, we're talking about algorithms, learning, okay, well, I've got to do this before I do that. I know somebody in the chat wanted to change Brian's problem. What happens if it's a random generator? That's actually something you can put in the code. And then you can put a counter in there to see how many times it takes before it lists all 27. That can be done in code. And using this 10 minutes of code, your students would be able to do that themselves, not the teacher having to take extra time out. And we've built in that productive struggle inside of our lessons. So this actually gets the students kind of started. It gives them a little chart about when to use which loop. And now what are we going to do with it? Well, here's the application. It's a actual word problem. It is talking about uh, bank notices. We got several bank accounts. So it's something that um, is actually maybe a practical thing that the students most, well, everybody's going to have to do something with the bank. Um, I know a lot of students, they just, okay, I'm going to deposit, I'm going to, I'm going to subtract and I'm going to look at what the little printout says or look at my app and see how much money I have, but they don't actually think about um, the actual goings on that has to do with the banks. So this, I love this application right there because it makes them think about the stuff that goes on and what happens <laughs> if uh, your bank account don't work out as planned. And so this is the application that you are going to see for uh, unit four. So now as we are getting close to the to the end i would like you guys i want to show you before we uh continue on for more question and answer i want to show you the other stuff that ti has for you 
if you go to education.ti.com, which you've probably seen several times today, you have a host section for activity. So um, we talked about creating the codes from scratch. We've talked about these programming activities that are built into the 10 minutes of code. But you also have STEM activities, and I know we're talking about coding, but I just want to put a plug in here. Those of you that haven't actually looked at the TI website and you're thinking about productive struggle, not only with coding, but everywhere, Texas Instruments actually has all of these free sections of their website. So we have 84 Activity Central, which is for even younger grades. So this is not all just high school. And which I know I, I expect a lot out of my kids. So, I mean, my sixth graders were doing what some teachers would all think that was just um, for high school. But I would let my sixth, I mean, because with code, there's some of that math that they may not have to, to know. And if I give them a starter code and they're just changing, like Brian said, and even a uh, kindergartner is going to start listing those animals. So, but the 84 Activity Central actually works with lower grades on some of its stuff, but has tons of activities. And you have Math Inspired, which works with the Inspire. Building concepts in mathematics is definitely, we're talking elementary level on the building concepts. I love those. Talk about productive struggle with those building, I love those. The TI Codes, which is where we went today, this is where you find it. And one of my favorites, which I have started doing a lot of sessions on, is STEM activities. And I'm just going to take you to that very quickly. You have all of these STEM resources, and yes, if you are not aware of the Innovator, oh, that's awesome. The Rover, that's awesome. But your students can do these big projects, and my students actually did the design the smart systems. We actually did several of those. And Workshop Loan, guys, you can borrow equipment from Workshop Loan for a couple of weeks to use in your school and as long as the equipment's available. Now, if there is a big conference going on, it may not be available. So you need to plan it out ahead of time and get with Texas Instrument, see when it would be available. But like you could schedule it for a few months out. They would send it to your class. You can use it in your class and send back to them. And it's free for you to actually borrow through workshop loan. And you can find all of these projects, look, quick projects, Make it quick, meaning these are quick little projects that you could do. Um, there's some for the rover, the Mars rover challenge, navigate. So you have these. Here's some for the hub. Um, I like the mood ring. You actually don't need very much equipment for the mood ring. I do this. Um, I did this in like as soon as they came out with this little STEM kit, I would borrow it like twice a year for my students to be able to code the mood ring because it was pretty cool. It's almost worth buying the little sensors that you need. And these all have the option of instead of your students coding from scratch, you can actually get the starter code so the students are just as Brian was showing with his code, changing the numbers and thinking about the math and science more than the coding if you choose to go that route. All of this is available on the website, folks. Um, you do have Science Inspired. This is where we're going to find uh, that famous zombie lesson, which I always loved, that they have. Um, also, you know, how the brain develops with the zombie. Um, my science teacher, I sold her on getting the Inspires when she saw uh, all of the Science Inspired lessons that she loved. So this is definitely um, a core website that every teacher should have available in their toolbox. This is free, folks. And let's say you don't even have Inspires in your classroom. You can actually get a sample of this teacher software so that your students could actually work through it. I mean, you could have them take the paper, do some answers on paper, and then you could do it as a whole class, or you could have students come up to the board and actually use this in your classroom, even if all you had was the teacher software along with this free website. So there's so many different ways that you could use this for productive struggle in your classroom. And the 
possibilities are just numerous. I I'm not even going to, I'm not even going to assign a function to it because it, I mean, it's, I, I don't want to say infinite because I'm sure that there's an end somewhere, but once you start working through them, you start coming up with ideas on your own, your students. I love to show the students and then pose to my students. What do you see how we could use this? And the students, they start beg, can I write a program for this? Can I write a program for this? Can I use this program on the test? And I say, yes. And I changed the way I created my test even for the students. And I know we have standardized testing and there is a place for practicing standardized testing. But I did not want my classroom to be all about boring drill and practice. You know, that's just one element. We really want that productive struggle and being able to code is a huge, huge part or tool, I should say tool, a huge tool that you could use for your students to get that productive struggle and they're actually combining math. And if you throw in a lot of the STEM stuff, that's where your science is going to come in with that math and then you can marry them together like STEM really wants you to do. Okay, Brian, let me stop sharing. So we wanted to see, I don't, um, did we get all the questions answered? That's my first thing is, did we get all the questions answered? I, I believe we did. I think um, Parisa is actually faster on the keyboard than I am. <laughs> so, <laughs> I, doing awesome. I, just, I just finished typing and look up and see Parisa's already beaten me. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so I want to leave a few minutes at the end. If anybody had um, questions. I don't see any. There, there was one. I'm trying to get the link. Um, we do have some coding activities that are specifically aligned to just math standards and I'm trying to get the link for you. Um, but if not, Melinda, you, if I don't get it in, in time, you can um, call 1-800-TI-CARES mm -hmm. or you can email us and we'll get that to you as well. I'll put my email in the chat. Um, so um, first thing we have in the chat, the link to all the resources and activities that Brian and Michelle shared at our TI codes website. Some people mentioned the software. Um, we do have a syllabus program, so teachers can submit their syllabus. Um, I'll put the form, the link to the form one more time. And um, you can submit your syllabus and we'll send you the 84 software, the Inspire software, or both um, at no charge. You just upload your syllabus. Um, so we are, thank you, Jenny Kelly, for adding the coding with Python, uh, the math activities to the link. I appreciate that. Um, I will add the link for the software one more time. Um, I did do, I did choose my random, um, my random winner with my five-year-old and the winner of this session is Daniel Irving. So we will reach out to you and let you know, and you can pick your technology. Um, Daniel, you were the number my daughter picked in the list. So, um, Thank you all for spending your Saturday with us. As soon as we finish this, you will get a link to a survey that you can fill out um, and just answer a question about the session. And here is the link for the software. I also, um, if anybody wants to uh, laugh at me and you want to check out my uh, YouTube channel, I did put that. Uh, it's called Why of Math. Um, it is not popular enough for you to probably search for it and find it, but on my website, you can get to it. And I will say that is the script, um, the, the production, all parts of that was done by students. So uh, they, uh, that was their productive struggle in my project based learning class that I had. They actually um, got an algebra book. They wanted their goal was to create videos to make math interesting. And so there are little hooks that teachers can use to introduce different topics. And so for a couple of years, uh, my students generated uh, the scripts and they put me as the star and made me do all kinds of crazy stuff. So feel free to, to look at those and uh, uh, enjoy them. It's a it's a good laugh all on your own. <laughs> <laughs>
Well, I've got just one last present for you all. The uh, the sun has just come up. So uh, <laughs> welcome welcome to October. Um, <laughs> uh, it's a lovely sunny Sunday morning. <laughs> Thank you all again for joining us. We hope you enjoy the rest of your weekend. Bye-bye. All the best. Bye, everyone. Enjoy.